Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Winter Signs of Wildlife. My name is Laura, and this over here is, I'll let her introduce herself. Hi, my name's Jade. And uh, we both work for the Maine Department on Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And um, today we're going to be looking at different types of tracks and other signs that wildlife leave here for us to see when we actually can't see them themselves. So we're going to do a couple of things inside, and then even though there's no snow, we're going to go ahead and head out outside for a little bit as well. Perfect. So I'm sure many of you are thinking, I don't get to see a lot of Maine's wildlife sometimes, and where are they? Well, a lot of the wildlife, they're actually really well adapted to not be seen. Part of their survival strategy is to be camouflage or to hide when they see a person coming because they might see us as a predator. And so there are other ways we can see them. So if you were to go outside and even though there's no snow, I really highly encourage you guys to get outside sometime today or over the weekend um, and to try to figure out what kind of wildlife maybe you have around you. Of course, always be careful, follow safety precautions when you go outside, make sure someone knows where you are and be prepared. But if you were to go outside right now, I bet you could find at least one type of sign of wildlife. I want you to think for a minute, what is it that you think you could find? So one of the things that I almost always notice as soon as I step out my door are birds. Birds, because they can fly, they tend to come closer to us because it's really easy for them to get away. And so we can hear them. They're very chirpy this time of year. They got a little bit of sing song going on. But you can also see them flying around. A big bald eagle up in the sky, a chickadee at your bird feeder. They're kind of everywhere, right? You might even get to see some squirrels that come down and you know maybe they're eating some seeds or some acorns or something like that, right? But a lot of the other wildlife, they're a little bit more secretive. And maybe they only come out at night or maybe they just don't want to be around us because they're really not too sure about us since we're people. But let's think about other things that we could. If we can't see the actual raccoon or we couldn't see the actual porcupine, what are some of the signs that we could see that these animals could leave behind for us to find? Well, one of the first things you might think about might be things like footprints, and this is just a rubber mold, right? Footprints or animal tracks are one of the really big things that people often think about when it, we think about tracks. But we also have other things. So let's think a minute. Hmm, what else might you see? Well, one thing that you might see are these sticks, right? And when you look at a stick, you might think at first, oh, there's nothing here, but I'll notice there's a change in, in it. We got some chew marks here. Some of this bark's been, been kind of eaten away, right? So that's a sign something's been here. Now, over time, you could learn what kind of animal bit this, what kind of animal chewed on this. Um, if it's up high, maybe it's something more like a deer or even porcupines, they sometimes chew on tree branches. If it's a little lower, it could be a beaver, right? We all know beavers are really good at chewing on trees. And so if we look right here, right, you can see all these different chew marks. You can actually see it's like teeth, the teeth are scraping right along on it. And of course, sometimes we even see the big chew marks that the beavers leave behind, right? So it's kind of a really fun, exciting thing to think about. On this branch, you can kind of see right off the end here. I don't know if you guys can see that pretty well. You get a little chew mark right there. Something just bit it. And this would have been a branch. It was up higher before, maybe like, you know, around this height. What could have bit an end of this branch off? You might think moose, and a moose is definitely an animal that could do this. It could take away some of the, some of the tree bark, um, but it can also be a white-tailed deer. And so the white-tailed deer um, also very often in the winter time um, they'll, eat, they'll eat the different um, buds off of trees rather than soft green leaves and things. They start eating buds and the ends of the new growths of tree branches. So over time, this all starts to become a skill. So all the different items we're going to show you, you might think they're kind of hidden, right? Like, I'm never going to find these. But it's all about learning to see because very often these different things, 
they're just like a change in the pattern. And so when you go ahead and you're outside and you just see a snowy field, right? Eventually you might see a line of tracks going through. So that's a change in the landscape. Or you look at a tree and you notice something's different about it, right? There are some, some scratches that go across it. And so when we see these different changes in the natural pattern of the world around us, you're actually making observations of wildlife signs. And there's all different kinds of wildlife signs. Um, can anyone think of any others you might find? You might have a, a few key, uh, clues here around us. We'll back up a little so you guys can see a little bit more. So one of the things I really think is fun about this time of year is the leaves. They're falling off the trees. They're all gone and they're very bare branches. So you might see things like you might see a wasp nest up in the tree. Um, you also might see bird nests and bird nests are a sign of wildlife. People don't always think about that, but it's a sign that wildlife lived near you during the warm weather. And so you'll see these and we do, it is good to kind of leave them there in the trees because other animals sometimes use them. You'll sometimes find mice storing berries and things and seeds inside of them. But these nests are a sign that birds were using the land around you. So go outside later, maybe not right now, later, and go ahead and see if you can find some bird nests in the trees or in the shrubs. You're going to find that they're actually in a, there's actually probably quite a few, no matter where you live, as long as you have some kind of trees or shrubs or bushes around you. Some other ones that people sometimes find, and not everybody is as fond of these, are things like scales, reptiles, snake skin. So right here is a nice snake skin. And this snake skin, it, um, it just comes right off of the snake, right? So you and I, we can get new clothes as we get bigger, but as a snake grows or as they age, they have to replace their scales that protect their body. And so they'll shed these. And if you're lucky enough to find one, you'll know that you could have a snake living nearby and maybe they were helping to do mouse control. <laughs> That's always something kind of fun. Um, but you don't always find these. And one of the reasons you don't always find these is they're full of vitamins and other things will eat them. So you might not always see them around you. All right, anybody else have another guess? How about antlers? I know antlers is something we all hope to find when we go out in the woods, or maybe you go purposely looking for antlers, shed antlers, all right? So these are from our white-tailed deer, and the males or the bucks have these in the fall to help them, you know, fight for their right to mate with the females and, uh, and reproduce, but they don't keep them year round. They're heavy, they're made out of bone, right? And so it takes a lot of muscles to keep them up and, and use them for fighting. And so, you know, after the mating season's over in the fall, these, these start to come off. And when they fall to the ground, they don't get wasted. Nature doesn't waste things. If we look really closely at these, you can actually see chew marks. And these chew marks can happen from a lot of things. So you can have some on this other one here too. You can see it's kind of really broken, this one. What kind of animals do you guys think might have chewed on these? Well, there's a lot of animals. So some of you might have dogs that like to chew on antlers at home. Well, in the wild, coyotes, um, and sometimes even different kinds of cats, felines will also chew on antlers. Uh, mice are a really common one. On this other one, there were a lot of little scrapings and they just were gnawing away at them. And that does two things. It helps to keep their teeth from growing really long because their teeth keep growing and it gives them vitamins. This is full of calcium. So a fallen antler and fallen bones in the woods, they get recycled in nature. Animals eat them or they'll decompose and go back into the soil. So when you're looking for animal science, you're actually learning about a lot of the different things happening in those habitats around the ecology of the ecosystem that you're in. And so you get to learn about the animals that you share your space with. And I think it's a really fun way because sometimes you might set up like a camera trap and you can see the animal, right? If you catch a picture of it while you're, while you're back in your house. But seeing these things just when you're hiking or going for a walk in the woods, or maybe you're snowshoeing, it kind of helps you to learn more about the animals that are in your space. All right, let's see. What are a few other items we might see? 
Well, if we're talking about bones, sometimes you find something like this. And look at this. What do you guys think it is? It's a bottom jaw of a raccoon. And so this bottom jaw was obviously part of the raccoon and died. And this was all somebody found out in the woods. And I know it's a raccoon because you know you can tell by its teeth. So you can learn about what an animal ate by its teeth. This one had some pointy teeth, some sharp kind of canine teeth. And then back here, we only have one, but there were these kind of flattish molars. They're very similar in a way to human teeth. And what kind of things do humans eat? Well, we eat plants, we eat meat. I mean, we also eat things like cheese and maybe a raccoon in a dumpster might get to eat some cheese, but <laughs> normally they don't. Maybe they're eating some kind of shellfish, some snails, some insects, right? But we can tell that they can eat meat and plants because of the type of teeth they have. It's also not big enough to be something like a bear, right? So we can look at it based off of its size and really get an idea of what kind of animal we're looking at. Um, if you want to learn more about skull ID, there's a lot of really great resources out there and you can go ahead and try that. Another really fun thing when we're thinking about this is fur. So normally fur is always on the animals and we won't always see it. Sometimes when they die, there's fur. Sometimes they just shed fur. I don't know about you guys, but my cats shed fur all the time at home. But even other animals shed fur. Maybe it's because they're itchy. Maybe it's because they got in some kind of scuffle or fight with either a predator or another of the same species. But here I have a handful of fur. It's kind of wiry, it's brown, it's got some white to the tips, but it's really dark brown in a lot of spots. And when we look closely at it, it's really, really wiry fur. Do you have any guesses what kind of fur this might belong to? This is moose. And so moose and deer fur can look a little similar. Mooses tend to be, moose fur tends to be a little longer, different colors, but they're both in the deer family. So they're, they're both very wiry. So you can even learn to identify animals based off of their fur, right? So there's also raccoons. Raccoons have similar color fur to a deer, but they're softer, right? And so you're not gonna necessarily be able to tell a raccoon maybe from some of the other really soft furs, but you could tell it wasn't a deer. Can you guys think of an animal that has really specialized fur for, for protection to kind of help it? You know, we, we kind of have maybe one around here. I'm not sure if you guys can, can you see maybe here? Hmm, <laughs> right here is a porcupine. And you might notice right away that our porcupine, he's a little different. This is an albino porcupine. It means he's lacking the other color that porcupines normally have. So one of the things about porcupines that's really fun is they have these special pointy quills. And these little quills have points on them to help defend themselves. They can't shoot them, but they can get stuck in an animal's face or paws if they try to attack. And they shed them just like other fur. And because they're a little bit harder, than most fur, they tend to live and be around longer in the, in the wilderness. And if you go hiking or snowshoeing, or maybe when you're out hunting, you might actually find porcupine quills on the ground underneath maybe a hemlock tree. And so keep an eye out for maybe some chewed off branches because one of the things that's really neat about porcupines is when they sit up in the branches of maybe some kind of hemlock or other trees, they chew on things. And, some of the branches will fall to the ground and it's kind of easy to see, especially right now when lots of things are dead and not a lot of fresh green growth. And if you see that on the ground under a tree, go up closely and look. You might just find some porcupine quills and you might find some little, some little brown porcupine poop that is a, it actually has a fun shape here. Do we have, oh yes, here it is. Here is some porcupine poop. Of course, this is not real poop. I would not pick that up with my bare hands, but you can see it's kind of the shape of like a bean or a cashew. Um, and these, this is one of the ways to identify them, but we should be more scientific than calling it poop. Scientists call it scat. And so scat is another really fun way to identify animals. 
There's actually a whole rap song about it. You can find it online for the fun word. It's called the scat rap. It's incredibly fun. And I recommend you learn it. I'm sure your parents will, will love it. So how many of you have ever found a mysterious scat or poop <laughs> out in the woods? And you ever wondered what it is? Well, there's a lot of different ways to tell it. So I showed you some of what the uh, porcupine poop would look like, but we'll have Jade bring the camera a little closer. We'll take a look at a few others. So here is beaver. They're very round and they're very uh, short, but they're very like spherical. You don't always find them. They mostly poop in the water, but that's, that's what their poop looks like or their scat. One of the other really common, one of the common ones to find on like beaver scat, which you can't find a lot, is fox. So foxes, and even fishers actually, they can look slightly similar. They have these very tapered ends to their scat. And a red fox likes to poop in very obvious places. Middle of the trail, on a log, places where the smell can carry. It kind of helps them claim their territory. And you can tell they're different from dog scat, right, from pets, because they tend to have things like little bits of fur in them. They're not quite as mushy looking because they're not eating dog food. But you might find this on your next hike, and they like to put them in very obvious locations, the red fox. Another one I'm sure you're all familiar with is the white-tailed deer. And the white-tailed deer, they're like little jelly beans, right? Little kind of oblong ovally spheres and you know they they often will find them in piles if they're staying in one spot and they're eating but if they're walking you might find just a couple at a time going going through the woods and if you want to know if it was moose versus deer moose is quite a bit bigger when you've come across some moose scat you'll you'll be able to tell for for sure so lots of different kinds of scat out there but let's think a minute about some other signs. There's a lot of ways you can find wildlife. Now, I know we mentioned birds before, but how often do we always see all the different species? I'm not seeing them all the time. I might hear them if I learn what they sound like. But there's this really popular big woodpecker here in Maine. This guy. Anyone know what the kind of bird this is? It is the pileated woodpecker. It's one of our, it's our largest woodpecker. He has this nice red mohawk off his backside here on top of his head. And they can make some pretty big holes. All woodpeckers will make holes in trees. So they'll make tiny holes when they're, they're just looking for food and they'll make bigger holes when maybe they're looking for a nesting cavity. Um, so here we can see a couple different kinds of holes here. And you can see this nice rectangular one this one is a pretty good telltale sign of a pileated woodpecker. So next time you're out and about, and if you see any kind of debris on the ground that looks like wood shavings, look up, look at the tree and see if you can see any holes in the tree. And sometimes there'll be several going up the tree because they've used the tree for a lot. A lot of different purposes. So, I hope you guys are having fun with this because there's a lot of different ways to learn about wildlife. Let's see, can you guys think of another one? Hmm, how about, look at this. Anyone ever been hiking along a river and you find piles of this on the sides of the trees or anything? Look at this, it's kind of, it looks kind of like someone used an ax or something and chipped it apart. They're kind of big, these wood chips, all different kinds. What do you think? I don't know if anyone saw where I picked it up from. A beaver. So sometimes you'll see these because they're, especially if it's freshly chewed, look how brightly colored that is compared to the to dark ground, right? So that's that change in pattern. So when you go out walking, you can go ahead and look for this change in the pattern and see this lighter color and then look, look up the tree and you might see some chew marks on it as well. So it can be a lot easier to find. Now, I know a lot of us are quite fond of turkeys around here. And I don't know about you. I keep seeing flocks in farm fields, right? They're going through looking for easy to find food. But right here on our little, 
our little turkey friend. We'll bring him in a little bit. There we go. Turkeys have a lot of feathers on them, right? And they lose them from time to time. They replace them as they grow in new feathers and other birds do this too. But some really fun feathers to find belong to the turkeys. So you might find a tail feather or you might find a wing feather just on the ground. And these feathers, they replace themselves as long as the turkey is still living and they can grow in some new feathers as well. So feathers all have different markings. And when we look here at the turkey, we can see some nice, some nice patterns here going up of alternating stripes and then a really dark band across the top. Now that tells me if I found this, even if there were no turkeys anywhere nearby, that would tell me that this is a turkey, right? Something to kind of be fun to learn about if you're ever trying to find turkeys. And then you also might come across some of their wing feathers. They also have some different stripes to them as well. Now, all different birds have all different kinds of colors and patterns. If it's a great horned owl, let's get Mr. Turkey out of the way. If it's a great horned owl, the feathers might have some different colors to them. Maybe they'll have some whites, some tans, or some different kind of dark browns, but they have a pattern to them as well. And owl feathers are really soft. I should mention though that if you find an owl feather or bird feathers in the wild, it's best to just kind of leave them there. Some, some bird feathers you're not supposed to keep. All right, well, let's continue along the way and thinking about if we're walking along waterways, there are some other clues to wildlife that you might find. What would that be? What other animals could you find? Well, if it's a pond and it's a clear enough day, maybe you can see the kind of mucky, sandy bottom. You could see some of the lines are, are made in the sand by different snails or mussels, right? Maybe you'll see some, some marks made by fish, right? They can make some, some, some marks in the sand, but there's another animal I'm thinking of. Look at this guy, the mink. Mink, muskrats, otters, they like to eat things like freshwater mussels and snails. And so sometimes you might find broken shells along a stream or along the edge of a pond. And so finding signs of these will let you know that maybe there's some kind of muskrat or a mink or animal like that living nearby. And it also lets you know that a snail used to live there. <laughs> the snail might have uh, been uh, eaten, but that's still a sign that a snail lived there as well as a sign that a mink ate there. So a lot of our smaller animals can leave little uh, food litter piles around. Um, and maybe later when we go outside, we might find pieces of um, acorns and I mean acorns, pine cones and acorns, because we have some little furry friends, the squirrels, who like to eat the seeds from inside of these cones. And then they just peel off and leave the pieces of these just laying all over the ground where they eat. It's like candy wrappers. At least these will biodegrade. All right. Now, one thing that everybody always wants to learn about are animal tracks. Now, I highly recommend when you want to start learning about animal tracks that you use some kind of field guide because the field guides are going to help describe to you how the animal's walking, what kind of things to look for in the toe pattern, right? and even the size. So there's a lot to look at when we're talking about tracks. So having some good field guides is key. And on our website, let me just grab this real quick. You can actually download a copy of our track guide right there online. This is one of our little track cards and it shows some of the very common different kinds of footprints of animals that you could see here in Maine. And it also has a little ruler on the side because they all are different sizes. So it's a good thing to kind of carry one of these maybe in your back pocket or in your backpack that maybe has like your water bottle and stuff with it as well. But we're gonna take just a minute and look at a few of our more common tracks here in Maine. And we'll start off with a pretty easy one here. We'll start off with the white-tailed deer. And so deer and moose, um, they walk on their toes, or actually they're their toe nails because it's a hoof. And they have two toes on um, the white-tailed deer here. And they're, you know, like you know, three inches long about or so. And when they walk, 
they actually are heavy animals. So we'll see if you can see this here. They make a pretty good imprint as they go. All right, I'll try to make a couple here. And so it's easier to see it probably from the backside here. You can see they make a couple little toe indents as they walk. And depending on if they made it in snow or mud, they could look bigger or smaller. So that's the white-tailed deer. And they walk on their, on their tippy toes or their toenails actually. So you see that, that, that hoof mark. And they like to walk in a straight line, one foot in front of the other. All right, let's smooth this back out. Take a look at another one. Another straight walker is our fox. And a fox is a canine. So it's in the dog family. And they have one, two, three, four little toes there. And they have that pad in the middle. They do have claws. If it was a coyote, you would almost always be able to find the, the claws and the footprints. But sometimes with foxes, because they like to be a little bit more cat-like sometimes, you don't always notice their claw marks. But they also, will walk in a straight line, one foot then the other. And they often will even put their back foot in the same place as their front foot. And so you actually never really get to see all the footprints because they overlap. But you can see a little bit right there. We got the pad, the toes, and a little bit of the claw marks there. And they'll also go in a straight line, often in a straight line that's following maybe mouse or chipmunk footprints as well. Then we have animals like the raccoon and the possum. I mean the porcupine, sorry. The raccoon and the porcupine, these both have a front foot that's different from their back foot. And they both waddle a little bit when they walk. And so that means they don't have a nice straight neat walk they actually go, here, I'll show you if I can. They, can you guys see? Yep, they put one down and then the other, and then one down and then the other, right? And imagine they're doing this with four feet, not just two, but they're a little bit wider apart when they step. And they also usually have a little bit of a tail drag there too. So I've seen some of these lately being posted online and people are wondering what they are. Um, to me, it almost resembles like big tractor tires from a distance going through the snow, but there's only one, not two. Um, so it's kind of neat to find. So a lot of really different cool ways to find wildlife, right? I know we went kind of quickly through some of these, but I mean, let's recap real quick. We had bones, including antlers, and those can even have chew marks that show us different things about different animals. We had snake skins, uh, skulls and jaws. We had bird nests. We had fur. We had chewed on pieces of branches as well. And we had things like scat and footprints. So there's a lot of things and including sounds of course as well. So sounds can be really fun, especially when the owls start calling later in the winter time at night. Um, but what I thought we'd do now is maybe we'll head outside and we'll see if we can find some tracks. Now you guys can stay comfortable right at your computer. We're gonna turn the camera off for just a second so nobody gets kind of dizzy while we walk the camera outside, but let's head outside. So of course, as we get ready to go outside, we want to make sure we're always safe. So make sure you wear the right kind of layers for the temperature that's outside. If you're going for more than just the backyard, make sure you tell somebody where you are going. Almost forgot my track guide, just in case. All right. So we're just going in our backyard. So we're not gonna bring a whole bunch of things like water bottles, a compass, snacks. And we're going with the buddy system today. A 
little chilly today, so we're definitely going to wear our jackets and our hats. A little bit of snow. Right. All right, so here we are outside. We're going to go ahead and we did come out and do a little scouting. Um, so we do know there's a, a track or a sign of a wildlife near me. But a couple of things I like to bring with me when I go wildlife exploring, a ruler. Maybe I want to measure something or take a picture with my camera. And my wildlife track card in case I want to help identify something that I see. I always like to bring some kind of little jar or something with me in case I find something that, you know, I don't really want to handle, but I really want to look at. And then a magnifying glass. Because sometimes you got to look at the finer details to figure something out or it's just kind of fun. So, out which is ground, there's actually something kind of interesting here. When we look on the ground here, there's something that stands out a lot to me. There's something that's a little bit different in color than the rest of things. You guys see it here? Maybe a little tricky, so I'll point it out. You guys see some spray And they go up the branch even, right? All the way up here. Something was chewing on this bark. Now it is a kind of been up higher in a tree around here. If it was on the ground, I mean, squirrels can chew, but they're usually going for things like nuts and berries, rabbits, right? New shoe hairs. Maybe if you live someplace where there's a cottontail. But also, if it was a pie, right? It could have been a deer. So as we look at it, we can see these different scrape marks. The teeth would kind of pull at that. And we notice actually, this bark is kind of shredded, right? It's pulled up. A rabbit could just bite that off. It has a top teeth and bottom teeth to its, to its mouth. But a deer doesn't have its top teeth for incisors, just the bottom there, right? So it has to, it has to scrape and pull the bark off. And so sometimes you get these frayed edges. So that's one of the ways we can tell if it was a rabbit or if it was a deer, these kind of frayed edges get kind of pulled up off the bark. And if we also look at the end here, we can see that same fraying. A rabbit makes nice snips, nice clean snips. This one's more frayed. So that way, one of the ways we can tell, and it probably was a deer that was here. So that's really exciting. In deer one, you can definitely find signs. And like I said, this time of year, their diet switches to harder, more woody plants than soft things. All right, we're gonna take, we're gonna turn the camera off again so we don't make you uh, seasick here. Now let's see what else we can find. All right, let's turn that camera back on. All right. So if we look right here, this nice dump, and everybody kind of likes a nice eating area, or at least some animals do. look right here. Bits and pieces of pine cones and acorns. They may remember we kind of talked about this inside. What kind of animal might really like that? Hmm. It's probably a squirrel. A rabbit doesn't really eat like this, but a squirrel, the food litter, right? They, they opened up and they ate the seed out of that. So it's on the edge of, a, of, of an open area. So. All right. There we go. We'll turn the camera back on for you guys to see. All right. So if we look at the ground here, do you guys see 
anything? It's really hard to see. But Yeah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna touch it with my poop. You don't really want to touch with your hands. Have some little little poops bean shaped a little bit. Okay. It's the second guys, we seem to be having a sound problem. All right, we seem to be losing our sound. All right, so here we go. Now you guys can hear me again. So we're looking here at the bottom of this tree. And we can see the cat. And we also saw on the leaf here a party. Well, not pretty exciting. So sometimes porcupines will sleep in trees if it's not too snowy. When it gets really snowy, they go and make little burrows nearby. But they also go up in trees to eat. And if you're up in a tree and you have to poop, well, it falls to the ground. Very cool. But again, things like sticks to help us look at it. And in this case with porcupines, there's squirrel. There's thing in the... All right. So I hope you're all having a lot of fun. And even though there's no snow, it is so much fun to go outside. And you know what? Some of those signs might have been covered by snow. So if we had a lot of snow, we might not have seen all of them. So I know we prefer snow to go out and snowshoe and have fun, but you know, I want you all to get out there, have a lot of fun, look for wildlife signs, do some birding. But if you don't want to go outside, let me show you something you can do inside. All right. <clears throat> all right, everybody, we are back. That was a fun trip outside. I hope you all go outside later. But maybe you don't want to go outside, or you already did right here. Right, and this is a track story. We made this and we made it using rubber tracks. But you don't need to use rubber tracks to make this and do some stamps. You can also use a sponge, right? So you can make a track out of a sponge. You can look up, download this poster, something in the shape, and then stamp it out using a nice little ink pad and make a story here. So we call this a track story because it tells a story. Now, if you go outside and find track, there's always a story to be told, okay? And so here we have these pink ones, right? Let's just hop through our kind of a field here. Your chipmunk, 
went through, right? Four little toes and claw marks. This is our fox, our fox also. And then look, two toes, we talk. It's a deer, they're bigger, so they take less steps. And so these different animals all came through here, but something maybe happened. If we look down here, we have a lot of chipmunk and fox footprints. What could have happened? Well, we see we have chipmunk going in, chipmunks with their four, four feet, two back feet, always land in front of the two front feet, kind of hopping along here. Looks like he stopped here for a little bit. Maybe he ate from the plant, but he also left. Now the fox came in, he went backwards, but he follows the chipmunk prints. So I think the fox smelled the chipmunk and followed it, but they, they didn't run there at the same time. So the chipmunk lived. So he just passed through. But you could make your own thing like this. You could make a track out of a sponge, which is a cardboard and then stamp with them. Um, or you can just go online and find some rubber repli tracks to help you out. You could also use Play-Doh, which can be a lot of fun and make a track out of it. One of the things that's really fun to do with tracks is you go ahead and you take your Play-Doh and you shape it and maybe stick it in the bottom of a cup. And then you can make a track out of that. You can either make the track using your fingers to make the shape or use a rubber track and make the print. And after you do that, you could make it in, out of plaster. You can mix up some plaster, pour it in the cup, and you could end up with something like one of these once it dries. So there's a lot of different activities you could do. If you don't want the mess of dealing with plaster, making up a plaster of Paris, you could get this stuff called model magic. And when you go to the store, oh, there it's ripped. You go to the store and you buy yourself this model magic. It's like special, really neat clay. And you shape it. This one's a little dry. But you shape it, you flatten it out. And you can go ahead and take one of your tracks. You can make a print in it. And you can let it dry. If you don't have fancy tracks at home, you can just rip yourself off another piece here. And then looking at the shape of my tracks, I can go ahead, flatten it out. Maybe I want to do turkey. So I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna use a piece of stick because that's skinnier than my finger. I am going to press down one way and I'm gonna, this might look more like a crow when I'm done. <laughs> press down the other way. All right, and I'm gonna make a little turkey track. And then when that dries or a crow track, when that dries, I can go ahead and paint it. Painting is always fun too. So there's a lot of fun you can have with tracks and animal signs. You can go outside and you can look for them and learn about animals that live near you or you can go ahead inside and make things like a track story. So we wanna know if you guys have any other questions for us at this time that you'd like to know more about tracks. Laura, while we're waiting for questions to come in, could you recap the track story prints one more time? Yeah. So let me get our crafts out of the way. So we can go ahead here and we can look at our track story. And we can see here that the fox took a walk across the field and went back around this way. But these pink tracks, these kind of purpley tracks, are chipmunks. And so the chipmunk can hop right along and look at different plants. And then it stops down here. We see the fox and the chipmunk interact together, but they're pointing in different directions. So they probably weren't there at the same time, especially since the chipmunk was able to exit and not get eaten. And then we had a deer that came across and didn't seem to interact at all with the other tracks. So a lot of things happened, but probably not the same time. Sometimes 
we'll see something like a rodent or a chipmunk go through. And what happens is if a predator comes in, the rodent chipmunk, the rodent or the chipmunk tracks never go back out. And that means they probably got eaten. So you can tell a lot by just reading the track patterns as you see them. Thank you. Um, so one question we have is, you mentioned that some animals can eat things and chew on things like wood and pine cones. Um, but if we tried to eat wood or anything like that, it would break our teeth. So how do animals do that? Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of animals are able to chew on, on, on trees. Some like deer only eat the soft outer layer like the bark. And so they actually can chew on it with fairly fairly normal type teeth. They don't have any special abilities, but their stomachs can specially digest the bark. But if we take a look at, let me just chew our, our turkey out of the way. If we take a look at our porcupine here, we can see he has orange teeth. And those orange teeth are not just because he doesn't clean his teeth, but it's because they have a special coating of iron on the outside that makes it easier for them to chew on things and their teeth don't break. So rodents and porcupines and beavers and muskrats, animals like that that chew on a lot of hard trees, they have these iron enriched teeth that keeps their teeth from breaking. And their teeth are always growing. So even if they did kind of chip, well, it grows right out. And so they have to chew on hard trees to keep their nails kind of, their, their, their teeth kind of filed down. Thank you. A few people are also wondering um, if you had any tips or ideas of where people could go for a walk to try and find signs of wildlife. Yeah, there are a lot of great places that you can go and look for signs of wildlife. If you have a yard, I recommend starting there just for practice. But then if you could, you could go on to mefishwildlife.com and look up a local wildlife management area near you where you could go for a little hike or a walk with your family and look for signs of wildlife. You can also go on Maine Trail Finder, which is another great place to find places to go walking and hiking um, and even look up local land trusts in your area. There's a lot of really nice land trusts all throughout Maine that have properties, um, including Audubon as well. So there's a lot of different types of properties where you could go for a walk and go for a hike. I don't see any other questions coming in, but if anyone has any questions, please send them in to us and we can answer your questions. Yeah, and we really encourage you guys to go ahead and go online to mefishwildlife.com and look underneath our educational program section. And you can find a section called Learn at Home and there's downloadable activities um, about things you can do out in the woods, but also these downloadable posters and track cards that you can have and print off at home or have on your phone to help you go ahead and look up um, some different wildlife tracks. So some great resources on there as well. You can also look under our wildlife section and see some of our species facts pages to help learn more about some of the animals that maybe you find signs of um, while you're out on your walk. Any other questions? All right, well, since we don't have any other questions at this time, I wanna thank you all for joining us. If you have any more questions, please feel free to reach out to us and we'd be happy to answer them. But again, thank you very much everybody for joining us and we hope you have a great and happy uh, new year.